wrong, but good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We'll read from Revelation. In the New Living Translation, Revelation 21, 5 through 7 says, And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so glad that you love us and that you care for us so well, that you give us freely of the water of life, and that's through your Son, Jesus Christ, and his atonement on the cross. And Lord, we just thank you for your plan that, that included us, and included everyone who will accept you as Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, as we worship you today, clear our minds and help us to concentrate on the things that really matter, the, your word and your, what you're speaking to us. Be with Pastor Tom, give him freedom to speak the word of what you've laid on his heart. And in all things, we want you to have the honor and the glory. Amen. 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 Has the Lord been blessing you? Yes, yes. He has. Amen. Tell you what, you wouldn't want to be any other place, would you? No. And then in the Lord's presence, and we are coming up on such such an exciting time to to be in the Lord's presence. Easter next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and that's a special time, it is. isn't it? And then the Easter Sunday. Well, uh, as part of our announcements. Uh, we still are going to help distribute some candy and things tomorrow down at the schoolyard. Now, do you have all the help you need for that? Yep. All right. We were going to try to have uh, something here at the church, and we decided that that wouldn't work out, and so the school would decided to put it on down there so they can take care of the kids and keep them from get too close to people and all that so they feel a little bit responsible for that but we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and and work that out maybe next year maybe if we can get through another season of this I don't know we it, it's been difficult hasn't it and uh, we're doing good all right last week we were talking about uh, Jesus one of the things that he said on the cross and today is one more of those I want to talk about. In John chapter 19, and I'm going to turn in my uh, King James Version this morning and read several verses for you. John 19, John chapter 19, I'll give you a moment to look that up. This is such an important topic that we're teaching on right now and those things that Jesus said. And, and what I would like for you to do before we even start, how many of you have ever been to a passion play or have seen a movie about the crucifixion? And so that makes it a little bit easier for you to see in your mind. And I think for the many years that most of us have been in church and, and preached and learned about, uh, taught about what Jesus went through, we can picture in our mind and we can kind of place ourselves I kind of like to place myself, and the reason that I do that is because in 1964, my dad and our family uh, from the Nazarene Church went to the General Assembly out in Portland, Oregon, and that's a trip that I'll never forget, 1964. Uh, now, I was born in 1953, so I must have been, I don't know, I, you do the math. We were all little kids, and we took a station wagon. And so there were four of us, I believe, at the time, four kids. And Dad drove the station wagon in 1964. We didn't have all the super highways to get there on, so we had, we, I can remember winding through the mountains and camping up high in the mountains and getting kind of nauseated up there from all the whipping around like this. And I don't do very well with that. And then you're camping at, at a, I don't know, 9,000 feet or something. And what? 
I remember getting a little bit uh, sick there, but uh, we, as kids, we, we had fun. We didn't get lost, I guess. But all the way out there uh, to the General Assembly for the Nazarenes and for four weeks, and I, and I can remember on, on the, so far, we went all the way down in Arizona, all the way up like this, and then back across the Badlands and back down through the, the top, and we took a, we took a boat ride across from Ludington to Cadillac there and uh, but the the distance from Cadillac to home you know is, is like 156 miles or something Boy, that happened quick after all that riding in the car and we camped all the way out and all the way back now here's the amazing thing when we left we took 700 bucks for the whole trip how about that <laughs> and, and we had enough money to make it. But can you imagine doing that now? We couldn't hardly get out of state for something. <laughs> Verse 23 in chapter 19, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top, Throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Verse 27, and then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciples took her unto his own home. My text today is verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. He was thirsty. Verse 29, there was, now there was a set, a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Father, this morning, as we picture in our mind the setting that was taking place, help to put us there personally this morning and so we can be touched personally in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Of all the things Jesus suffered, you might think part of this uh, fact is that thirst seems to be a little bit inconsistent. At the beginning of his ministry, he began his conversation with, with a Samaritan woman, if you remember, asking her for a drink in John chapter 4, verse 7. He used his request as a means of talking with her about the kingdom. And he gave her living water. Those who drink of this eternal water will never thirst again. We're not actually talking about the water, are we? We're talking about spiritual water. Mm -hmm. And I like that verse where it says, he had an opportunity. And I had an opportunity. I went to get a shot this week. Uh, in fact, it was yesterday, wasn't it? All right, so uh, I took the shot yesterday, and I'm still here. Oh. <laughs> That's good. But in the process, there was another gentleman sitting beside me, and he got his first, and he came out, and he sat down. And he was just talking to me for a short minute. And he was talking about what it was like to get it and what it felt like. And, you know, he was kind of sharing that with me. And I took the opportunity, because I'm always preaching about that, saying, take the opportunity to bring your church into it. And I listened to him, and I didn't detect any bad language or anything like that. And so I said, well... Our church has been having a little bit of a tough time. Get, you know, we have people that, that will come. And we want to be inside, and we want to be outside, and we want to have mask on, and we don't want to have mask on, and that's just the way it is uh, as we worship now. 
Uh, and I didn't, I didn't get any comment back from him about his church or anything like that. I was a little bit slightly disappointed, but there are so many ways, folks, that we can talk about Jesus by the spur of the moment to introduce him. And so we need to use that. I just threw that in there. That's not really part of the sermon. <laughs> Listen, how, how significant that Jesus began his ministry uh, by asking for water and now ends it by asking for water. Meanwhile, he used the thirst as a theme in many instances, didn't he? What a great common denominator. Thirst is for both the body and the soul. And today, uh, with Jesus, we're looking at the soul. You know, Jesus suffered many things. If we, if we think about the time that he was here on earth, and especially up towards uh, the cross, how terrible were Jesus' enemies. Um, during his ministry, they surrounded him with, with jeers. And uh, at the cross, they continued to taunt him. And, I, and during his trial, he did not even open his mouth, as we said in the scripture today, but on the cross... His sufferings were so great that he had that he had he just had to speak this particular hour. And you can see how humanity, how man he shone forth in the Savior. You could see the the man in him. He was all God, but he was also all man. And I thought about uh, the suffering, even those who were there, and you know, we see stories where where they when he was walking with the cross, where they spit on him and they jeered him and they said bad things. Doesn't that have you ever had somebody do that to you back maybe when you were a little kid or something, or when you were a teenager in high school? When somebody said some comment like that or made fun of you or spat upon you, for say. Uh, it really hurts, doesn't it? Sometimes that hurts more than sticks and stones thrown. Sometimes words hurt more. But he endured all that. Although Jesus' cry, I thirst, seems mild when compared to the other brutalities that were inflicted upon him, in reality it may have been one of the greatest. And uh, to die of thirst is one of the cruelest deaths. And I wanted to ask you this morning, do you recall times when you have been extremely thirsty? Has there been a time in your life when an amazing thing was, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, man, this shot has caused me to have a very dry mouth for some reason. Now, maybe I was one of those that was just sitting there, like that, <laughs> sucking it, you know, trying to, get the fly catcher going there. <laughs> but uh, I woke up with a very dry throat. And I thought, what is this about? But I got it going again. I got up and got a sip of water. But uh, it, it apparently wasn't anything to do with that. But you have probably, what do we say? I'm spitting cotton. You ever been thirsty like that out in the job and you can't wait to get down? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you need to go get a drink because that thirst, we're not supposed to let it get that far. Mm -hmm. Are we? You kidney stone and fish on it. I you know, I have a problem with that a little bit too. But at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he hungered and was tempted by Satan, and at the end, he was thirsty. The devil used every possible means. Now you know that guy, and he will do everything that he possibly can to trick us and defeat us, won't he? He used the same thing. He used every possible means to defeat the Savior by making him take a shortcut to his Messiahship, but Jesus would not yield. We do not find, however, that he cried out in, in this last struggle. His bodily anguish needed to find expression. Didn't it? Our physical needs may be forgotten uh, temporarily during a crisis of spiritual conflict but they always assert themselves with great insistence, eventually near the close of what's going on. Jesus suffered. We've got to have that in our minds. This wasn't an easy thing. And he did so for our sins. 
And we've sung about that this morning. We've talked about it. And he did that for our sins. Yes. It wasn't, yeah. it was for everyone's sins that would ask yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. And for me and you. Yeah. Secondly, Jesus did not dodge duty. In answer to Jesus' plea, the soldiers gave him vinegar to drink. And uh, when we first read this, we're tempted to suppose that that was because of the, the unnatural uh, type of drink they offered. The men intended to insult Jesus. Well, there were probably those that that, that, that was an insult. We thus rank it among the taunts and suffering Jesus endured at the crucifixion. You think about, the, well, they tried to give him some kind of concoction. A closer look at the Oriental historical customs, however, shows us that vinegar was a, was a common drink of the Roman army and was most likely to be at hand at the moment. So I don't know how they did that. You ever tried to drink some, some vinegar that we have? Maybe this was different, or maybe it was diluted with something else, but the Roman army actually had some there. We read elsewhere that Jesus was offered a different kind of drink, but refused it. He was offered a medication, uh, medicated potion, wine mingled with myrrh to deaden the pain. But Jesus refused that, didn't he? Right. There, are, there were probably uh, different ways that People could have offered him some kind of a pain deadener so that he wouldn't feel that, but Jesus didn't want to do that. He wanted to, to feel the whole thing. Otherwise, uh, can you imagine if the Bible said, well, Jesus died on the cross and he was in a complete stupor and never even knew what happened. That wasn't dying for our sins, was it? Jesus refused to meet death in a state of stupefaction. Jesus refused because he would conquer sin not through the fleshly, but through the spirit. He had escaped from pain and suffering through some, if he had escaped through some kind of medication, he would not have borne our sins completely. The vinegar or sour wine he received was merely a refreshing draft and did not in any way deaden the pain or make him suffer less for our sins. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? It, is. it seems like in a world that we live in, we're seeking some kind of pain deadeners all the time, or people are, they don't want to be here for the problem, so they just deaden themselves to it and they're out, and then they come back and it's still there. That's where we need Jesus the most, isn't it? Yeah. Calvary, thirdly, you know what? I might as well say it. Calvary was not a pretty place. I don't remember exactly all the details of when I was a kid there because it was an outdoor thing. And there was rocks and a canyon and uh, we were sitting up an embankment like this. But the hill of Golgotha over here, that was none of it was intended to be a pretty place. I don't remember there being flowers all over the place and the beauty of it. Not at all. Now you take the Christmas story. That's beautiful, isn't it? What a beautiful thing. But not so with the message of the cross. The story of Jesus' crucifixion is actually, it's ugly and it's painful. And it is easy to say, let us now go even unto Bethlehem but it is not so enticing to stand at the foot of the cross and hear the Savior cry, is it? Psalms 69 is certainly a foreshadowing of this dreadful event. And I could take that foreshadowing and go into a whole message of its own this morning. Uh, how that was a foreshadowing of what was to come. But it was. Jesus identified with it when he quoted it. He was saying that he himself was the very heartbeat of this ancient Hebrew hymn. Jesus identified himself with all the hope Israel ever had in a Messiah. His cry became a sigh in a dry, thirsty land. Have you ever seen how truly ugly all Jesus' suffering is and how we should shudder afresh? And I think we do 
every time we read the story. That's why every year, at least, at the very least, we need to talk about this story even more during the year. This was not just a once-in-a-lifetime thing that happened. This comes about, we celebrate that with Easter, but there are many times that we can remember. It's a good thing to remember Jesus and what he did for us every time we take communion. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> he yeah. said, do this in remembrance of me. Because Jesus suffered, millions have been blessed with personal salvation and strength for everyday living. Right. Even in his cry for thirst, we see him bearing our sins in his own body on the cross. I thirst was the only cry of physical weakness that Jesus uttered. But there is something most sincere and attractive about one who is not ashamed to voice his weakness and pain. Jesus' action gives us the key to his saviorhood. He was afflicted in all of our afflictions. The cross was ugly and painful. People would gladly banish it from their thinking if they could. Calvary remains as the time of sin's victory, yet sin's defeat. Yeah. Yes. Of God's defeat, yet God's victory. Amen. For God's Son defeated sin once and for all by dying in humankind's place and rising from the dead. Mm -hmm. Do you remember going to see that movie, The Passion? I remember coming out of that play. You know, there was a little bit of excitement going in and talking. As the crowd came out, I didn't hear one pin drop. Mm. Not a thing. It was so quiet. Uh, I think people were kind of trying to uh, take it all in and, and decide what was that that just happened. Is that really true? Because that really brought it to light question is this morning for us, do you thirst? Do you desire to be someone better than you are? If so, God can meet that need. Yeah. He can. To the Samaritan woman, Jesus said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of of water springing up into everlasting life. John chapter 4 verse 14. This water that he provides for us isn't something that, you know, when you drink water later on in the day, if it's still hot, it, that disappears and you got to do it again physically. But this water that Jesus gives, it, you drink it and it goes on forever, doesn't it? Amen. That's the gift of eternal life. When we have met the Master and surrendered to Him and been mastered by Him, our lives will be different. We will no longer thirst for our needs. We will have been met and God's Spirit will have moved into our hearts. When He moves in and lives in us. And tonight we're going to expound on this message right here. Uh, about the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Yeah. So you want to not miss that. The message of the cross is that Christ can quench thirst because he wants thirsted. He can make alive because he conquered death. We must remember, however, that the Christian life is not an abundance of material things, but rather a realization of spiritual things. If you think that Jesus, and I've seen this done before, I've seen it written on a bridge a couple times. There was a time when people were going around and spraying on bridge posts there. Uh, Jesus plus, uh, uh, life plus Jesus equals dollars. Uh, not really. They had a false thinking about what Jesus was going to do, didn't they? You know, our lives... What Jesus brings us may not be all about material things. Okay. He needs to decide what is good for us. When Jesus brought the woman at the well face to face with her sin, she tried to change the question. She didn't really want to hear it. But which, which mountain should people worship on? 
Mount Gerizim with the Samaritans or Mount Zion with the Jews? Well, Jesus reminded her that the hour was coming when people would worship at neither mountain. He reminded her that God is a spirit and they, that they would worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. When he declared to her that he was the Messiah, she received him and went off to town to tell others. She was excited. She had latched on to something impressed on her that was going to change her life. She went to tell others of her great discovery. You too will experience this joy if you will surrender to him who has the water of eternal life. Yeah. It's as simple as that, isn't it? But we have to surrender to him. We can't just surrender part and expect that to go on. We need to grow in the spirit. And tonight we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to look at two things. Why study the Holy Spirit? And then we're going to study the Holy Spirit tonight and why we need him in our life. So tonight, if you can be here at 6, look forward to that. Singing and praising and hearing about that, it's an important thing, this water that we thirst for. Yes. You'll notice that <clears throat> if you remember back before we knew about Jesus and, and what he could do for us, that we were always wanting something. Wanting more, yeah. bigger, larger, more of it. And I do a lot of construction work. And you can actually see that in a, in a, in a way, people are searching for something, something to spend their money on, something to make them happy and things. We build buildings for people. And, that, and I got one right now that's going on. It kind of triggered this as being part of my sermon today because he seems to be he, he, seemed, he doesn't seem to have direction on what he's doing it or why he's doing it but it, it seems like to us that they want this building they want it heated he's got two different heating and air conditioning systems in it it's 40 by 64 it has an upstairs in it she's got a little spiral staircase going up like that and another big staircase going on up to the third floor and I, we're like what is it that you guys are going to do out here yeah. well we're going to get out of the house. <laughs> so they come out and do the, same, do the stuff that they would do out there instead of in the house. But it's a new, it looks like it's a, a new toy <coughs> that they've got. And they're doing, in this period of time, they're two, they got two girls and they're both, one of them left a long time ago and the other one is still there, but she's, she's uh, going to move out. What are you going to do with all that space? You can only go up in a room and sit there for so long and read so many books and then what? <laughs> but he has the ability to do a lot of things. When I talk to him about what we're doing at our church and things, they touched on a few areas. This lady is from the Philippines and so she, she's she got some different ways. I, I don't even understand what they're doing. but. It looks to me like they're searching for happiness, and uh, as Christians, we know where true happiness is, and it's not really in you know, all these things that we have, is it? Okay. It's good to be able to play with some things, but I'll tell you what: you got to put the God, you got to put God first Amen. in everything, and you got to realize. And uh, I'm working on this myself. I have. We've got to be uh, all in for Jesus Christ. Yes, we've Lord. got to uh, give him 100% first before everything else. Yeah. And then you don't have to worry about what you're going to lose if you, because you're really not going to lose anything if you give Jesus everything first. Yeah. And, and you see, part of what we're going to talk about tonight is the growth process of a, of a Christian. You know, don't be disappointed where you're at because if you're continuing to grow in Christ at the pace he wants you to, and you pay attention to the Holy Spirit, then he will take you on that journey Amen. through the Christian life. It's called the Christian journey. 
I had a whole book on that. And so, uh, let's stand together, shall we? Father, I pray this morning that through this message of, of Jesus on the cross, as he thirsted, and we think about the, his death on the cross, it was totally for us. And Father, we thank you that he thirsted. We thank you that he has that water, the answer to our problems on earth here. And so, Lord, if we continue to grow closer to him, take time to pray, take time to do devotions, and Lord, help our spouse grow as well, and our, our family, that's what we need to do. And so, Father, help us each one to do that. Uh, and then our church will grow. Lord, we have a great responsibility here. And as uh, the Christians here in this church, Lord, we need to be able to be uh, growing as Christians to all that the Lord would have us be ourselves. And then we can share it with others. We just pray that you'll help us to do that. Give us the strength and courage and leadership to do that. Be with us this afternoon as we ponder these things. And then, Lord, as we come back this evening, Lord, and hear the rest of your message, Lord, we just pray that you'll touch our hearts in a way that will never change and go back any other way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll look forward to seeing you.